Were you ringing that bell? I've been expecting you. It was foretold by gyromancy. Have you seen a little girl? Just turned seven last month. Short, black hair. Made to cash in on the survival horror craze of the mid to late 90s, Silent Hill became so much more than just another Resident Evil clone. Like Resident Evil, it became one of the standards for horror and games, and titles to this day still get compared to these series. While it does take influence and number of tropes from the world of Resident Evil, Silent Hill is so much more than just that. Its focus on psychological horror and the atmosphere creates a different approach that is just as good as what it focuses on. This is a series I've been meaning to tackle for a while now, or at least the Team Silent entries, the first four titles. To note, I did play this on an emulator, so there are a few visual and audio glitches. As well, I didn't do any upscaling, instead having it set to the resolution of the original title. How did Silent Hill come about? Looking to cash in on the success of Resident Evil, which released in 1996, Konami got a ragtag group together within the company to get cracking on something that was aimed to be a success in the West in the fall of 1996. Team Silent was created. Instead of relying on an all-star staff, the team was mostly composed of those within the company that failed on other projects or weren't ones that were exactly standouts among employees. Konami mostly left the team alone to do what they wanted. First time director Keichiro Toyama, who was the director of Silent Hill, was a bit of a scary cat and didn't have a lot of expertise in horror. While this may sound a bit odd, do note that Shinji Mikami, who directed Resident Evil 1 and Resident Evil 4, was in the same boat of being seen as a bit of a scaredy cat. Instead of going for shock horror, he focused on the unknown and the psychological, focusing on the occult and the works of David Lynch. Twin Peaks in the early 90s had a large following in Japan. But in Japan, there is full-fledged Twin Peaks mania. Everywhere you look, there are hats, buttons, books, and magazines. A 14-tape set of... <laughs> the game veered far away from what the higher-ups at Konami had in mind, but they let the team do as they wish. Do recall this was mostly unexplored territory at the time, and budgets were a lot smaller. So, let's get into Silent Hill proper. We play as Harry Mason, an everyman driving with his daughter Cheryl to Silent Hill. Swerving to avoid someone on the street, the car crashes, and Harry wakens to find Cheryl gone. We're in Silent Hill. The fog engulfs us, snow is falling, no one else is around. We see Cheryl in the distance that we follow, and continue to descend into this nightmarish world. This? What's going on here? Oh. Oh. And then we wake up in a diner. We meet Sybil, a police officer from the town over. Going to get back up, she gives us a gun and we head out to town to go find Cheryl. We get a radio, get attacked by a flying creature, and we're off to the races. While it may not look like much now, what Team Silent was able to get running on a PlayStation was sheer wizardry, a commanding understanding of how to push the hardware to its limits, something that they would continue to do with the PlayStation 2 titles in the series. Unlike other survival horror games at the time, Silent Hill does not make use of pre-rendered backgrounds. This is a lot more taxing on the hardware as a result, and yet the character models didn't really lose any fidelity. In both their approach that helped with the hardware limitation and the atmosphere, fog was added to the outdoor sections, which help reduce draw distance, and we also have long stretches here without a loading screen. The game's frame rate can be a bit slower at times, but it's not too bad. Another difference compared to other survival horror titles at the time, Silent Hill allows us to have control of the camera should we wish, although there are some points where we'll have more of a cinematic presentation with the camera, but otherwise it's under our control. In another note, the FMVs for the game, which 20 years on may not look like much, were another case of technical wizardry, all done by one man, Takayoshi Sato. Why was this the case? Why was he the only one? Due to the hierarchy of Japanese companies and Konami, Sato would not receive credit for his work. There would be a CGI and visual supervisor who would. So in order to receive credit, he ended up doing everything himself, which more or less had him live in the studio for three years. He would use the 150 or so computers around at night to render his work. While most of these FMVs are short, they do a great job of conveying emotions and expressions through facial work to convey what's going on. 
As the technology would get better, in-engine cutscenes and FMVs would later be used to help drive the plot forward in conversations in future titles. Here, the tech wasn't quite there for facial animations and dialogue, but they still made the most of it. And over 20 years later, I struggled to think of many series or games that made better use of sound design and music to complement the game itself than the Silent Hill series. Akira Yamalka not only composed the soundtrack, but the overall sound design as well. He joined the project as he felt that he was the only one capable of doing the project any justice. In more influence from David Lynch, the guitar-based work was heavily inspired by composer Andrew Batalamente, who did the soundtrack for a number of David Lynch works like Twin Peaks. I'd like to find out myself. However, Yamalka would look to industrial sounds, a cold and rusty feeling to flesh out these sounds of Silent Hill. It's funny to note that he mentions he doesn't listen to industrial music at all. The game has the right balance of knowing when to scale it back and let the silence come to the forefront. Having these industrial sounds for too long would wear out the player a bit too much over time. And these moments of silence can speak volumes with the tension they can create, or relief at certain stages. There's two types of environments that we'll be spending our time navigating, the town of Silent Hill itself and some indoor locations. Fog engulfs the streets, so we can't see that far ahead of us. The streets are unusually wide, giving more of that sense that something quite isn't right here. No other humans are around, cars are abandoned. The radio will pick up as enemies approach. Silent Hill never makes use of jump scares with its enemy encounters during the game, but instead that dread of anticipation. In the indoor sections, there is a period of tension of moving to a new room, waiting to hear the sound of the radio or nothing at all, in which you could breathe a sigh of relief. The streets will have rows that just end into the abyss or are blocked off. Luckily our map will update to remind us as we wander about. There isn't a lot of free exploration here. You'll mostly be guided as a result, although there are a few places that you could go that are optional, such as the police station, some will play a factor in which ending you get. Beyond a few grabbing of item moments, there's not much out here in regards to puzzles in Silent Hill. That's within the buildings of Silent Hill itself. While Harry Mason is an everyman, he can handle himself in combat, from close quarters to guns, although you could just tell about how he swings a weapon that this isn't his specialty. The game makes use of tank controls, and we also have the option of sidestepping. This gives us more options in combat, and will be really handy in certain boss fights. Oh, and Silent Hill beat Resident Evil to the punch with Quick Turn. Quick Turn would be introduced in Resident Evil 3, which came out later in 1999. Although here, it's pressing L1 and R1 at the same time, which should take some time to adjust to. I'm more used to hitting back and square or X to turn. The indoor sections of Silent Hill is more where we get into the puzzle solving and navigation that's more akin to classic survival horror. We have unlimited inventory space. The series would try limited inventory later in the fourth entry, but there was more of a frustration and failure than adding depth to the gameplay. I always appreciate survival horror titles with limited inventories when possible, but I didn't feel like not having it here was a huge loss to Silent Hill. They put their focus on other aspects at the forefront and knock those out of the park. One staple of Silent Hill are the number of inaccessible rooms as a result of broken locks. While it may seem frustrating, the map will update correspondingly to make note of which rooms we can't enter. But there's also something about these inaccessible rooms with broken locks that adds to the atmosphere. What can be on the other side of these doors? Considering all that we come across in some of these rooms, there's that great fear of the unknown that wouldn't be there if that weren't the case. Sure, they could have made these halls and buildings smaller with few doors that we could only go in, but a lot of that atmosphere and dread would be lost as a result. Puzzles of Silent Hill are satisfying. Nothing out of this world in regards to difficulty, but nothing that's a simple cakewalk. There is a level of satisfaction to completing them. The series would only get better with puzzles, especially with the fact that later titles allowed you to change the difficulty of puzzles. This is not found in Silent Hill 1. These sections, both indoors and out, will change at times from what they are into a more nightmarish landscape, those of the other world. A projection of someone's nightmares, dreams, fears. They're grimy, metallic, industrial, and meshes well with the sounds that we'll encounter along the way. The rooms now change, enemies will change, the sounds and layouts are different. What was once familiar is now flipped on its head. There is a great sense of relief when these sections end and things return to, well, not normal, but I guess more normal. 
Now I'm going to get into spoiler territory if you haven't played Silent Hill, as I'll go through the game and give some more of my thoughts on various things. Unlike a title like Resident Evil, where mostly everything in the plot is explained, Silent Hill takes the approach of leaving plenty up to interpretation and ambiguity. Sure, future titles, especially Silent Hill 3, give a lot more insight and explanation into what happens here, but I'm taking the approach of viewing the title as is. As well, these games, especially Silent Hill 2, has been dissected to absolute death to the point where it feels that some interpretations are taken as fact. Leaving things up to interpretation is a bit of a lost art in regards to video game stories. Hell, you could argue plenty of modern stories tend to veer away from this. Depending on what kind of story you're telling and your approach, that's okay. However, in taking the psychological horror approach, it's 100% fine to leave enough things unexplained and vague and let the reader, the viewer, or the player come up with their own interpretation. Besides, if the writer decides to explain this ambiguity at a later stage, it's more or less inferior to what others think it could have been. For example, Mass Effect didn't need to explain the Reapers with their initial Lovecraftian appearance in the story, but they decided to at the end of the series. You're not going to find many people saying that explaining their motives were the right choice. Oh, and leaving things up to interpretation and vague also differs from the mystery box, the infamous approach used by people like J.J. Abrams to build mystery intrigue and to draw in the viewer and toss it aside and move on. While not everyone can get away with it, David Lynch letting his work talk for itself is something I wish more creators would take. Sammy, uh, I never talk about themes. I note this that over the course of time, some of those who worked on Silent Hill have tweeted out some answers to questions that people have asked about the games. Granted, each individual gives typically a different answer to the same question, so again, it's a different interpretation. I didn't mention it earlier, but that first conversation with Sybil, something is really, well, off. Long pauses, the way they talk to one another. Where is everybody? I'd tell you if I knew, believe me. But from what I can tell, something bizarre is going on. That's all I know. You know, the limited technology at the time, they really did nail that David Lynch atmosphere of the way people talk in his works. That something is quite not right here, that dreamlike quality. It's something that the series would only get better at not only as Team Silent got more confident, but the technology became better to make the most of this. One of the game's most notable sections is the elementary school, and one of these strange influences that the game uses as reference, they made use of some of the layout and posters from the film Kindergarten Cop. The list of teachers here are taken from the members of the band Sonic Youth. While the series would get better with monster design as they got more abstract, there's still something quite unsettling about these little dudes wandering around and the noises they make. I should note that I mentioned a few times already that the series would get better at things. I'm not meaning that as a knock against this title in the series. How they were able to get so much right right off the bat in their first attempt is astonishing, and they'd only get better at it. The puzzle with the piano and the birds is probably my favorite puzzle of the game. There's just something really satisfying about it. Taking down the notes of the message, finding the keys that click, it's one of those that really has a nice sense of accomplishment when you do so. Getting that call from Cheryl in the other world is really unsettling and is a great reminder of what is at stake here, finding Cheryl. With so much strange and scary things that we've already come across, it's a nice reminder of why we're here and what we need to overcome. At the end of the school, we'll encounter the first boss. The boss fights in this game are fine, though nothing overly noteworthy. As the series would progress, these kind of creatures would become more abstract and out there. But there's a reason for their appearance here as is. There's a great relief of the siren greeting us back to the more quote-unquote normal world, the church bell going off in the distance. And from here, we get to meet Dahlia Gillespie. Something that always stood out to me is whenever Harry mentions her to anyone else, he calls her by her full name instead of just Dahlia. Her name's Dahlia Gillespie. Do you know her? At the start of this video, I started off the most memorable portion of this conversation, the mention of gyromancy. I've been expecting you. It was foretold by gyromancy. If you're like me, you're probably thinking, what the fuck is gyromancy? Well, according to Wikipedia, it's a method of divination in which a person spins around inside or walks the circumference of a circle drawn on the ground. So there you go. You could definitely mention someone like Dahlia doing this. Afterwards, we head on to the hospital, which of course becomes a staple of the series. We meet two other characters here, one being Kaufman, the director of the hospital, and Lisa Garland, a nurse. 
Oh, and we'll encounter for the first time one of the most iconic enemies of the series, the nurses. Lisa Garland is a nurse that we find in the other world. Outside of Alessa, she serves as the game's most tragic figure. She's very kind and helpful to Harry instead of just speaking in riddles. But there's something that's not quite right with her, and her memories have been failing her. After we head to an antique shop, and we get a fair amount of exposition dump here, both from Sybil and running back into Lisa. As well, you could take the time to wander around here a bit and make a stop at the police station and learn more about some of the drug trafficking that has been going on here and murder of certain citizens. For this portion of the plot of the Silent Hill, we get a few vague hints that are spread out, but it mostly stays in the background. And depending on how much you explore, can easily be missed. Talking with Lisa brings up this information about the Order, this cult, and all the nasty things that they're into. Weird occult stuff. Black magic, that kind of thing. That's what this is, you know. Satanic black magic. Sick shit. There's a bit here afterwards where we navigate to the lighthouse, we have to pass through the sewers. So instead of going all the way back to the school where the sewers are located, the game will just warp us there. And of course, you know how sewer sections can be. Luckily, you could just fly through this one in about five minutes of just simply running past everything. I would have rather had the game have us walk to the sewer, but face new challenges along the way, and then cut from the sewers to the next section. One major difference with this Silent Hill is the story itself. This really isn't Harry's story, it's Alessa's story. Compare that to the second and third title, where James and Heather, who we play as, is their story that the game focuses on. Silent Hill delves into some pretty dark themes here with Alessa, her facing severe cases of child abuse. This is subject matter that is not to be taken lightly and requires skilled writing to pull off this subject matter. And it's something that they do pull off here, and they would continue in the future. The daughter of Dahlia, Alessa is such a key and tragic figure throughout the Silent Hill series. Set up to give birth to the cult's god, she's under the control of the order the entire time. She's bullied at school and abused at home. Dahlia tries to use her to birth their god, but the ritual goes haywire and Alessa is burned severely. She's kept alive for seven agonizing years in the basement of the hospital in order to birth the god. And this other world? All these enemies that we've come across along the way? This comes from the mind of Alessa, mixed with her nightmares and fears. But in an act of defiance and courage, she splits her soul during the ritual, which becomes Cheryl that Harry and his late wife adopts. But Cheryl is lured back into town, and Dahlia uses us to trap the souls back together with Alessa to give birth to their god. And with the canon ending, although Cheryl is gone as she merged back with Alessa, in an act that can be seen as kindness and as a thanks to Harry, she splits her soul once again and gives Harry a newborn baby, before finally dying. It's extremely heartbreaking of what Alessa has to suffer through, not given the choice as a young child. But in the end, through her strength and perseverance, she was able to hold on for as long as she did, is nothing short of heroic. And of course, her presence would still last in the series, especially the third entry, but that's for another day. I mentioned earlier that Lisa Garland, like Alessa, is a very tragic figure. She cares for Alessa in the hospital, a kind presence, but she herself is being used by the Order, being hooked to the PTV drug to keep quiet about Alessa. And in arguably the game's best scene, she has the revelation of who she really is and why she can't remember anything. Save me from them. Please. Harry. <laughs> It's an utterly heartbreaking moment, and just shows the utter talent that this team had to pull this off. Luckily, in the canon ending, she also gets one of my favorite cases of revenge. It's incredibly satisfying to have Lisa return at the end here to drag down Kaufman, who is responsible for what has happened to her.
On the note of Kaufman, I've always found his character the most difficult to pin down. An optional section prior to the lighthouse will have us rescuing him and discovering more about the drug presence here, which he will come to snatch away. So even though he does make an appearance at the end, shoots Dahlia, and uses the substance to expel the god from Melissa, it still doesn't really make up for the fact of what he's done, and again, what makes Lisa pulling him to the abyss so satisfying. Unless I'm missing something like a note, it's through this action of how he expels the god that, unless you're looking up guides, you'll understand how to get the game's best ending. Or you'll be able to save Sybil instead of killing her in the boss fight with her. In his office, there's a red substance on the floor which you could pick up. In that case, you could use it during your fight with Sybil to free the parasite from her. The parasites are one of the game's most mysterious factors. They don't pop up later in the series. Of all the enemies in the game and how they tie in with Alessa, this one I've had the most difficult to try to get an understanding on. But hey again, ambiguity is a powerful tool when making use of psychological horror. Not everything needs to be explained. When it comes to the fate of Dahlia, there's something quite poetic about her getting fried to death at the birth of the god. Whether this is something she was expecting to happen, or she was hoping to see what would happen with god, it's hard to say but it's incredibly satisfying. However, this story doesn't end here. While Silent Hill 2 would mostly be a self-contained story, the third entry will deal with the fallout of the first title a number of years later, but that's a story for another day. With that, we conclude the first title in the Silent Hill franchise, which did very well from a commercial and critical success. Team Silent would put out another three titles in 2001, 2003, and 2004, before Konami disbanded them in early 2005 at which point they handed the series over to Western developers. Since then, the series has been on a pretty rocky course, the exception of having Kojima attached to the series for a time, but they managed to fuck that up as well. You could write a whole book on how badly Konami fucked up the series after disbanding Team Silent. And there's plenty of videos here on YouTube that cover why. And this whole thing with the abandoned Kojima Silent Hill reboot theory thing, I'm not that familiar with it, and again, who knows if it's really going to turn out to be anything, and it hasn't so far. So who knows about the future of this series? Unlike Capcom, who managed to get Resident Evil back on course, it's still up in the air if Konami will ever pull it together. From their past actions, I wouldn't have my hopes too high. One interesting note here is that after Silent Hill 1 launched, director Keichiro Toyama left to join Japan Studio, a first party studio for Sony, and put out the underrated Forbidden Siren titles. And on that note, I at some point do have plans to do a video on Forbidden Siren 2. Even with the loss of the director, the Silent Hill series didn't have a major dip in quality as a result. Most other key staff remained at Team Silent, and would put out what is widely regarded as the series' best title and on the best games of all time, Silent Hill 2, which, as of recording this, will be shortly celebrating its 20th anniversary. But it's always important to remember at where the series started, and what was a mandate by Konami to cash in on the survival horror craze, and what happened as a result. While many other Resident Evil clones were forgotten about at the time, Silent Hill forged its own legacy, one to the likes of Resident Evil, even if taking a different design and philosophy approach. A series that is still held fondly in fans' minds, and that has had a significant influence on not just horror games, but the gaming world as a whole. A series that, at least for the Team Silent games, are essential plays for anyone that is a survival horror fan. Ones that people have played over and over throughout the years. Ones that have been grained into people's minds have been theorized for years. And that's never going to change. It was foretold by gyromancy.